Good morning. I'm here today with world-renowned environmentalist Gareth Patterson from South Africa. Good morning, Gareth. Good morning, Denise. How are you? Very good. I'm so happy that you agreed to our talk today so that we'll be able to share some inspirational strategies to best help us navigate our way through this pandemic that we're all experiencing around the world. Absolutely, and thank you very much for inviting me. So let's begin by a little bit of your background. You grew up in Africa, in mm -hmm. Nigeria, later Malawi. You worked as a game ranger. You, after publishing several books, you worked with George Adamson. That's right. Of fame. And when George was killed by poachers, you ended up rehabilitating three of his lion cubs back to the wild in Botswana. Yep, that's it. And from that experience, you wrote two books, Last of the Free and With My Soul Amongst Lions. Very, uh, very touching books. You also worked very hard to uh, advocate against the canned lion industry in, uh, in Southern Africa. Yeah. Yeah. Also worked very hard um, in 1998 to uh, bring world attention to the, the horrific treatment of the young Thule elephants that were being yeah. relocated from Botswana. That's correct, yeah. So through most of your career, you worked with lions, but you then moved to Nizna and changed your focus to elephants. Yeah. And, and from that, you wrote the book, The Secret Elephants. Yeah. And then in 2006, for all of the work that you've been doing throughout your life, you were recognized in South Africa as environmentalist of the year, and that's quite an honor. It was, it was, it was indeed. So over the years, you've written 12 books. And your last book just came out in, uh, in January, Be Beyond the Secret Elephants. And you've already gotten great reviews on that. But the focus of our talk today is actually about a book that you published in 2001. The book's called To Walk with Lions. And... I have a copy of it here, and it's uh, the seven uh, principles of true spiritual fulfillment that come from living with the king of animals. And in rereading this book, it's very clear that there are a lot of lessons that we can apply now mm. with what we're experiencing in the pandemic. You are no stranger to trauma. In the past, you've experienced one of your lions who you considered a son being shot mm. by a trophy hunter. You also had to endure having another of your beloved lions shot because she was accused of unjustly of killing a person. Yeah. You've received many, many death threats over the years because of your work advocating mm. against the can lion uh, industry and also with the Thule elephants. You've experienced a health scare mm. where you were given three months to live. Yes, the doctors were rather pessimistic in hindsight, yeah, on that one. That was 14 years ago. And fortunately, you're well and with us yeah. today. Yes. So over the years, you and, and many of us have experienced trauma. Mm. And in fact, it's, it's quite a high percentage. And right now, many, many of us are, are having our lives disrupted mm. because of the pandemic. Uh, People are experiencing depression, anxiety, loneliness, loss of purpose. They, they feel socially isolated. They don't have a community. They've, they've been removed from their religious support. Many, many people are also experiencing economic stress. But you mm. 
have some guidance for us. You have come up with seven precepts uh, inspired by the lions that you feel could help us not only with issues that we've been dealing with in the past, but also the current crisis. So could you share with us what these seven precepts are? Yeah, it's, 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 it's been a very interesting process. As you rightly said, I mean, I wrote this book close on 19 years ago. And um, what was reflecting then to me, um, you know, going through my own trauma and all the rest of it, and also looking through, through, you know, at the world through the eyes of lions, because when I was living with lions in the wilds, when I was rehabilitating them back into the wilds, these three famous Adamson lions that I, that I inherited, if you want to call it that, from the late great George Adamson, the, the grand old lion man of Africa, after he was tragically murdered by ivory poachers. Um, after spending so much time with them, I was spending between eight and 12 hours a day, every day with the lions in the wild. And I was spending far more time with them, with their kind than my own kind. Um, so I was, I was very much living as a, you know, you can call me a human member of the pride, but I was part of the pride. I was like a mother and father figure for them. They have, a, lions have a very long childhood. This is something very important. They, you know, can take for up to 18 months or more before they are really prolific at hunting and establishing territory and all that sort of thing. Um, so I was very much living in, a, in, the, in the world of the lion and seeing the world through their eyes. And there's certain attributes that I saw, not only in the, in the, in the life of my lions and my, my experiences with them, but just with lions generally, because I studied lions in the wild back in the early 80s and, and then right the way through. So I've always been someone observing the behavior of lions and seeing interesting parallels with, with, with humans. Lions are, are social animals and so are we. They're very tactile animals. If my lions were laying down in the bush, laying down on the ground, um, relaxing or in the shade of the tree during the heat of the day or whatever. Very interesting because one would be touch, one would be lying touch with the paw on the other and the other one would be touching or the foot of one would be touching the other or the tail of the other. So there's always this connection between, between them and it's, it's, it's a very close-knit society. Um, when the lions would greet me or greet each other, there was a lot of contact and I learned not to call back because that contact is always reinforcing uh, the social bonds. <clears throat> now, today with the pandemic situation, what we find ourselves is that we find ourselves um, <sighs> e perhaps even more feeling um, feelings of great loneliness, spiritual loneliness, general loneliness, and also a, a lack of purpose. And this is exacerbated by the fact of no social contact that we can have and the social distancing. So this really does, as us as a social being, um, put us in, a, in, a, in an emotional dilemma. And that's where I feel that, you know, that we've got to overall look at the, the, the seven principles that I described in this book to, to Walk With Lions. Um, and I'll just run through very briefly what they are and and if people can just think about what I'm saying in terms of these three uh, presets and and um, and what what it means to them in their daily lives you know I'm talking about seven uh, seven pre precepts principles of the lions but think about it in your own life as well not necessarily through the life of lions these are these are principles that apply to to all of us and that is self-reliance fellowship uh, willingness to care, um, affection. Affection is really loved by, by another name. Uh, determination, courage, and the last one being loyalty. And to talk about all of those, you really do need to, to read the book. And what I do is like separate little sections in the book, whereupon I actually give very, very inspiring examples 
of the precepts, be it a, a self-reliance or fellowship or whatever it is, <clears throat> of what I've witnessed with lions. And at the end of each section of the precept, there's a simple meditation which takes you there to imbue yourself with that inspiring, um, with that inspiration of the line of that particular precept. Now, <clears throat> it's actually a, a, a very gentle um, process, and I believe that it, it, it can apply to everyone. And people can say to me, but Gareth, I live, I live <clears throat> on how many stories up on, the, on, a, a, on, a, you know, on a tall building or whatever it might be, skyscrapers or whatever, I feel so connected to the earth. And I said, but everyone is connected. It doesn't matter where you are on earth. Wherever you live, wherever you work, you're actually connected to the earth because everything is connected to the earth. The buildings, whatever is connected to the earth. If you can't get into a park to do a meditation, a meditation from the seven principles of the life, you can do it in your own home. You can just still yourself. And that's, that's the whole thing. And I, I think sometimes we need to wake ourselves up to the fact that we are very much part of the, the greater whole. We mustn't think of ourselves as separate from nature. And I think what the pandemic has actually done, ironically, has made people realize that we are not separate from the rest of nature. We are just one species and one species, just like any other species on earth, is very susceptible to what could come round the corner <clears throat> and we don't know where it's coming from, that something can specifically hit our species. So on another way of looking at, at it, very simple way of looking at it, and it might, be, might seem very simplistic, but <clears throat> just, just think about what, how you breathe. What is enabling you to breathe? It's oxygen. Where does oxygen come from? It's the whole processes with with the trees and the vegetation, all the exchange and all the rest of it that's given us oxygen to breathe. How do we live? We eat. Where does that food come from? It comes from a natural source. Doesn't matter which way you think about it. You know, um, the water we drink, what is the origins of that? It's from nature. So I mean, that those three fundamentals of life are all things that are directly Milk doesn't come from a bottle, if you know what I mean. Um, everything that we consume, everything that enables us to live is, is derived from nature. So nature is that mother life-giving force. So that is the first thing to remember, really, is that you're not separate or alone. You're not. You're just part of an enormous whole. And with that, that takes away feelings of isolation and loneliness because none of us can actually be alone because we are all connected. I like to describe it as, <clears throat> it's almost like a braided stream that flows and it intermingles, but it, it's all part of one strand at the end of the day as the water runs down this braided stream. And that's, that's us and that's how we're all connected. And that's the, the, the pathways that connects all of us on earth. So really that's what the seven principles of the line is all about, is don't feel isolated. We, I know it's very, very, very difficult, but <clears throat> if you go through these meditations, you will feel, you'll feel, the most important thing to feel is to feel grounded, that you feel part of that earth, to reconnect as a being, with, with that earth that surrounds us and with the air that we breathe and the water that we drink and the food that we eat. Could uh, I take a moment to just share a sample of one of those now? Please do, Denise. So from chapter one, after feeling and getting into a comfortable position, allowing all your stress to drain away, feel the calmness in your body. Still your mind. Breathe in slowly and steadily. Hold your breath for two seconds, then breathe out. Feel the stillness. Begin to feel grounded, anchored to the earth. Feel through the heaviness of your relaxed state, your connection to the earth, to divine nature. 
once you're relaxed and your tension is drained away, tell yourself, I am with the divine. I am part of divine nature. I am not alone, but a part of, upon, and surrounded by the divine. And you would continue to repeat these words. Very beautiful. Very beautiful, Gareth. Thank you. It's very simple. And yet in my own experience, I've seen how it has grounded people and, and they feel part of a, of, of a greater whole through that sort of thing. So Gareth, you've spent your whole life being close to nature. Mm. Right now, though, you live at the edge of the forest and you're connected to nature each day. Could you share a little bit about what your life is like now? I think more than ever, you know, I've never taken for, for granted at all um, the very privilege that I've had being in, in nature. If anything, today with the pandemic, um, it's even heightened my appreciation more than ever before. The wonder that I get of right in this little cabin that I live in, I get visited by a family of guinea fowl, which are like in, this, in the United States, I think you'd call them perhaps partridges or something like that. And they come and visit me or the monkeys come and visit me. I've got leopards that are roaming literally on my doorstep here. Um, and that is really amazing and fantastic. But I can be in a town, I can be on a book promotion in London and be a, a, surrounded by um, you know, millions of people and all the rest of it. But if you can just break away to a little park and you just see a little gray squirrel or just the ducks or the grease, the geese on a pond or whatever, I get the same connection feeling there in, in a major international city or whatever as what I do here on the edge of a, of a massive wilderness area and, and forest. Um, it keeps you very humble. It keeps you in your place. And... Um, and you can't overstep things when, when, you, when you're in awe, you know, without sounding too fanciful, but you actually, fanciful, you actually feel quite in awe and quite almost belittled by, by how wondrous it all is, that all this life is around us. So you spend a great part of your day hiking in, in this wilderness area as part of your research. Could you share what that experience is like and how you feel connected to nature? Well, I would be out and it entails a lot of time on your own. And, um, and that's fantastic. I mean, when I was, I came down to Nisna, this little town on the southern tip of South Africa back in 2001, <clears throat> um, partly because people were saying that um, in this wilderness area, there's only one last surviving Nisna elephant and it's an old female elephant and she's soon going to die. And that was the official story. And I came down here not to prove any, anyone wrong, <clears throat> but to see for myself. I came from a background, as you rightly said, with lions, but lion, uh, elephants have always been a big part of my life. So I set out uh, as a research project um, in, to see for myself what is the status of these elusive and highly endangered elephants what their status was. And I ended up, someone worked out over the years, within the first few years, I'd covered about 22,000 kilometers on foot, totally alone on foot. I don't recommend, by the way, people walking alone. That was just the nature of my research. That I had to do it that way. And I was looked after. And so nothing happened to me. I was very careful as well. And, um, and I covered 22,000 kilometers. And someone worked out that that's like walking, I think it's about halfway around the world. All I knew is that I'd gone through six pairs of boots until this person came up with, with this. But I was totally alone. And, um, and over those years, it was walking, walking is, 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 is like a meditation, uh, particularly when you're alone or alone with your thoughts. And it was a very good few years because in that time I discovered, thankfully, that there wasn't uh, just one elephant out there. I learned of various elephants out there. Uh, I discovered that there's a small breeding group that quietly, unaided by human beings, had just got on with things <clears throat> and had literally brought themselves from the brink. And that's another thing that I'm enormously grateful 
uh, where I'm speaking to you from now as the crow flies, uh, the nearest I've had these, I'm looking down to give you some sort of perspective. I'm looking down through a window in my little office down to the Indian Ocean and about three kilometers on the edge of the ocean. From here, I can see the little buildings of this little um, tourist town called Neisner. And people walking on that main street now, they would never imagine that only about two, three kilometers behind me in the north, there are these wild, free ranging elephants. That's how close they are to the edge of, edge of town, but they keep to themselves these enormous creatures. And that's a miracle on themselves because, I mean, the 90% of the elephants of, of this country were wiped out, you know, a couple of hundred years ago, but this tiny little population have hanged in there and they're still existing. And that's a beautiful, another wonderful example of freedom. And freedom, you can't put a price on freedom. You really can't. And I learned that with my lives. There's no, every single day that, that something is free and has a free life, that is totally priceless, in the truest sense of priceless. So you've spent almost 20 years in Nice now. And yeah. yet you still find it fascinating. What? Absolutely fascinating. And I can honestly tell you, that every single time I go out there, I, I, I do not regard myself as an expert in, in any shape or form on this area at all, because every single time I go out, um, I, I discover something new, something that I've, I've, I've never seen before. Just yesterday, it was I came across um, some droppings of of, of an antelope and they've been disturbed and I wondered what, and I, I, I discovered it was a small bird is actually pecking around it, which I didn't know that species utilized. It can be anything, discovering a new a plant that I've never seen. Uh, so this place, more than any other place that I think I've worked in, in Africa is full of surprises. It's always new things or a new bird species I've never seen here before. So constantly, constantly learning here. Constantly learning. You never feel you can never feel that you you know it all here. There's there's just too much to learn. Like I said, every single time I go out, I see something new. So important with yeah, people. it's amazing. It's important with people, no matter where they live, to be able to see the beauty in nature and see things with fresh eyes every day. Yeah. Now let's absolutely. I think that's so important. To open your eyes is so important. You know to. To, to see beyond what, what you normally expect to see and to try and see the unexpected. And then you'll see that the world is a much more fuller place than you could ever imagine. You've also seen some pretty extraordinary things. When you were living in Botswana with your lions, the three that you rehabilitated, what were some of the connections that you made to the lions? Oh, there's, there's just too many to really to really tell here, um, I, I think one of them is, 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 it's really from, you can say from, from, the, from, the, from the precepts, for example, of an extraordinary situation that happened, whereupon I was mother and father to these three lions, guiding them on life into the wild so that they can live as wild, free lions but how, in, and people said, I saved their life. Because if I, didn't, if I hadn't taken them on after George was murdered, George Adamson was murdered, they probably would have ended up in their lifetime of captivity. And, and that would have been awful. And to, to me, that would have been a fate worse than death for a wild animal to be in captivity. Because ironically, lions live for so long in captivity, up to 25 years. And yet in the wild, they only live for about 12 to 14 years. But if they can live that 12 to 14 years, it's life of such quality compared to imprisonment of 25 years. So it's all quality of life. But uh, telling the story very shortly, I was out with the lions one day and they were about a year and a half to two years old. And so they were like teenagers. And they came across, they came across uh, the footprints of a, of a leopard. They started by scent, which surprised me, followed where this leopard went. Now lions and, and leopards are, are great enemies because they're both like apex um, predators at the top of the pyramid of life. So they're competing with each other. 
nature is beautiful, but it can also in our eyes be seen as, as cruel or harsh. But let me tell you, not as harsh as, and, and, and cruel as what mankind can be sometimes. Um, and they track this leopard and lions will typically attack and kill leopards and leopards will typically try and kill lion cubs and it's because they're competing predators. So it's always this, this jostling with, with, with the two. Anyway, they came across this leopard, a, a big fight took place. I kept away to one side um, and they were fighting this leopard and, 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 and at one stage I thought the leopard was mortally injured and I saw that one of the lionesses, Ferrara, had been very badly scratched on her, on her face and I was up on a river bank um, and, the, and the leopard was lying on its back and like I said, I thought mortally injured and I called to Ferrara and, and she came up to me and I, I, I gave her water and she drank from my, from my hand. Um, from the, my cut hand. And then as I did this, the leopard saw me for the first time, spun around and just came straight for me. It was about 25, 25 yards away or so. And it came straight for me, 20 yards. And in the time that it took me to, you know, to, to rise to my feet, I just remember this, this, it was right there in front of me, still coming. And I just remember this, this golden shadow going over and above me. And down down and, and Ferrara hit into the, um, smashed in the, into the leopard and pulled it away from me. So there's the situation of the lions saved my life. Seeing me as part of the pride, they literally saved my life that day. That leopard would have killed me. So that showed incredible um, fellowship amongst us. They, they would have done that to, Ferrara would have done that for her brother Batian or for her sister. And so me being part of the pride, she saved my life. So that showed our unity and, and, and our fellowship and, and, and willingness to care all the things actually that I can actually put in this, the courage, the loyalty. I mean, there's the precepts already and just in one story. But on a lighter note, um, a lovely little moment in the wilds when they're still um, getting used to hunting for themselves and they're about a year old. And because I'm taller than them in, in the sense that they're more horizontal and I'm vertical. And I could spot um, prey species far off from them. And so if I came across a herd of impala and they're walking next to me, they learned whenever I crouched down, they knew that I'd seen something. And on this one occasion I crouched because I saw these impala antelope in front of me and I crouched down and uh, the both lionesses, Ferrara and her sister Rafiki, they went off, the lions have incredible pincer movements that they go off to hunt with. And Batty, and I don't know if it's a boy thing or what, but um, he was a bit, little bit slow um, to take the hint of what was going on. And I literally had to, I, he was just looking around, his sisters have gone off and they're hidden and camouflaged, and he's looking around not seeing anything. And I literally, as I was bending down, I had to take his head and that she pointed in the direction of the impala. And then the moment he saw them, he was awake and he got into hunting mode and off, off he went as well. It's special moments like that. You know, I could go on and on. They led me to their new, newborn cubs. They used me as a, as, a, as a babysitter to look after their cubs. Uh, with the death of Batty and they led their, uh, their babies, their cubs down to his grave, all this sort of magical, magical thing which showed the unity between between us with us absolutely beautiful moments <laughs> it's very clear that you establish a sense of purpose in your life and for you it's just naturally been working with environmental issues but can you talk a little bit about why purpose is so important in life? I think purpose is so important because, because A, and it's, it's something that we all have and that's something we must all realize that we do have. We, we are not here by accident. We all have got a role to play. Just like I was explaining about the lions and, and, and their role in a pride or whatever, um, every, every, everyone has got a purpose. Otherwise, if we didn't have a purpose, then life would be purposeless. 
And life isn't purposeless. Everyone can make a difference in, in the smallest way to the biggest way or whatever. Take the most inspiring stories. They're normally from you know, people from very, very humble beginnings who have made a difference in this world. It's normally those sort of people who do make a difference in the world. And we can take inspiration from all sorts of people and all sorts of things in this life. Um, so I have no hesitation in saying that everyone certainly does have a purpose and we must just be open to it, be open to our purpose in life. And, um, and you will find it and it will find you. So perhaps it's helpful for people to, when they're feeling in the depths of despair right now, to take the focus off of themselves and, and choose an issue. Uh, to support. Or choose them, or choose themselves. Even not even taking it to to the extent of of of, of people. I mean that that would be fantastic and great and whatever. But one of the best things that you can give to is to yourself, and and that can be introspection in a very very positive way, and 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 say to yourself, you know. Life, life was so terribly busy and all the rest of it, and we're all trying to earn a living, and life is just whizzing by and all the rest of it. But I mean, ironically, what this pandemic has given us is time for introspection. And think to yourself, what would I really like to do to further myself? And uh, you know, there's, there's people out there who have learned new languages or have done uh, free courses online or whatever it may be. And that is fantastic because you're nurturing and you're feeding yourself and you need to do that. I mean, we are like trees. We do need to be nurtured and you know, to, to get those roots firmly in place. So, you know, <clears throat> with all the negatives that come with this time, there is, there is the positives that it allows us to, to be introspective in a very positive way and to, and to think, how can I how can I nurture myself during this time? And people are doing it. They really are. And and you on the surface live a very simple life. You live in a cabin at the edge of the forest, uh, in pretty relative isolation. Do you feel that simplicity in life is helpful? I think I I really do think so. Um, uh, you know, people might imagine that, you know, over the years that, you know, because I've written so many books and so many different editions that, that I'm a wealthy person materially, but I'm, I'm not at, at all. In fact, the opposite, because everything that I've really earned through my books, I plowed into other projects because I'm, I'm an independent. I, I like to have that independence, not being dictated by other people's dictation, dicta how they dictate or whatever. Um, so I've self-funded my work over these years, and that hasn't been that hasn't been easy. But it's also been in, there's been a very good side to that because I've been able to be independent. But in terms of simple things, your appreciation level of let me put it of, of things generally are enormous. They really are. I mean, in terms of preparing yourself a simple mill. I mean, I live in this tiny little cabin. I feel as if I, I live in a pa palace in, in other people's eyes, if you know what I mean. I mean, there was a time when I was with, living with the lions for four or five years. There was, in the camp that I lived, there was no running water. The toilet was what we call a long drop, which is just a hole in the ground. The shower was just a, like this plastic sack or, or bucket that you pull up and fill up with water and you pour on you, there was no electricity. Um, so I mean, the fact that I'm living in this little cabin here that I can turn on a tap and there's running water instead of me having to get into a vehicle and go and fill up 40, uh, uh, 40 gallon drums of water from the nearest camp, which is miles away, or to make a phone call back in those days without you know, cell phones, mobiles or whatever, I'd have to drive an hour and a half. You know, I've got, I've got, even though I'm living such a simplistic life here, I feel like a king, to be absolutely honest. I'm really happy with my lot, so to speak, here. And I'm sure many people are learning to live with less of the luxuries that we've been used to because of the, mm. because of the pandemic. 
especially even just luxuries of going out to eat. Yeah. Uh, could, let's talk a little bit about the anger and loss that many people are experiencing right now. Um, mm. Not being able to see loved ones, losing jobs. Uh, for many people, it's the loss of their whole livelihoods. And what are some strategies that you feel are useful in letting go of anger? Let's, let's first begin by you sharing some of the times in your life that you were experiencing horrific anger. I felt um, horrific anger in various phases of my life. The three lions that I, I, I've been speaking about, they were nothing less than my children. I was, I was, I was like I said, the mother and father. Now, to people that might sound a bit strange, how can I, I feel that way? But I was, I literally was teaching them. I was seeing them through life. They have a, they, it's, it's like a human childhood, but condensed. So you have the infant stage, the juvenile stage, the infant stage, and then like growing into the sub-adults and then they're becoming teenagers and what comes with that and establishing themselves. So it's almost like parallels with what a human parent goes through. And I saw that and with, the, with the lions, it's about a three year period crammed from birth to young adulthood, if you want to call it that, or, or coming into adulthood. So all the things that humans experience during that or human parents experience, what you've got to give, what you've got to sacrifice um, with your children. That was very much what I was experiencing with the lions. And one thing with the human parents and what I experienced as well is, is the love that you give and the love that you, you receive. So when you've got these three children and, you know, and then by the hand of man, Batty and this magnificent young male lion, you know, he, he then gets lured out. After surviving a terrible fight he had with two other lions, he lost his, his tail was bitten off, he was almost killed, and then he recovers from that. That, that was an inspiration on its own, is that self-healing that the lions have got. And then perhaps go into this a little bit further when it goes to healing. But he healed himself from that horrific, and then he was spending for himself again, and he was about to take over another pride. He was doing everything right, and then trophy hunters arrived, and then they lured him out of the safe area. They used a, a bait. They used a, they lured him out of the safe confines of the reserve with a with a donkey, and a trophy hunter from overseas shot him dead, um, shot Batian as a as a trophy, and so I lost a son. And then, as you said earlier. I lost Ferrara and various other, their offspring, uh, unjustly accused of killing someone, which they didn't. Um, and then I had to voluntarily, I, I had to leave the area for the remaining lioness's sake, you know, that, that she can just continue there. It's better that I leave the area. So I, I, I forced myself into exile. I forced myself to have distance from her. And she went on, she went on to, to have more litters of cubs and eventually um, she was a very old lioness and she had reared all her cubs perfectly well and she was an outstanding lioness. But I lost my children and I, I don't think that there's a deeper grief than, than, than losing your, your children. And so therefore I became angry because I, I could see what caused the death of my children and was people and it was their greed or, 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 or their wrong way of thinking or whatever it, their egos in the case of Batian, he was shot merely as a trophy, you know, for someone to boost someone's ego. So I had a lot of anger and I was venting it, that anger in various ways, but not for too long because whether it's the pandemic or whether it's the loss of a love, loved one or whatever, anger is such a strange emotion because it's self-destructive. And we must, we must avoid, even though we're only human, so we get angry, but we must, mustn't let ourselves get tempted into the seduction almost of anger because by us venting our anger, 
we feel as if we're almost relieving ourselves of, 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 of our anger. But it isn't. It's a self-destructive cycle that we have. And you'll find that people will almost like wear anger as a medal on their chest. Now, I'm an angry person. And you, you listen to people's retorts and all the rest of it and their negativity because the anger is negative and it's very easy. Like I say, it's very easy to destroy something. It's not easy to build something or to create something, which is the opposite of anger. So I learned, and I mentioned in To Walk With Lions when it came to anger, <clears throat> instead of feeling that, that anger, which was destroying me to a certain extent, I learned to let it go in the sense that I would literally, in the meditation that's in the book, learn to throw light onto those people or that situation or that person that has created this anger on me to throw that light, that white light onto that person, that hoping that because their, their anger and their actions is coming from something. You see how it's self-perpetuating. They, they killed Batian. This person killed Batian because of maybe some problem in his childhood that he felt insufficient or whatever, his manhood or whatever. There's a problem there. It's always a, a, an action and a reaction with anger. And I just learned to, even to the person who killed Batia, throw light on that person, light of good, light of goodness, and to try and help them. And through that, it actually helped myself. And I didn't have that bitterness and darkness of anger within me anymore. It doesn't come overnight and it comes with, with practice added, but it's well worth doing it as opposed to being consumed by anger. Anger is a very destructive emotion. Are there any other experiences in your life where you had this intense kind of anger? I think, I think back then I learned to let go of it. So then when I, I'm only smiling now because it's, <clears throat> it's a serious subject, but there, there's always a lighter side to a serious subject in the sense that once I learned to let go of the anger of people who kill lions and, and all of this kind of thing, um, I, I, I exposed what we call canned lion hunting in South Africa, where, where it's a very sordid industry. Lions are being bred in captivity for all sorts of reasons. Um, firstly, the cubs are taken away from their mothers and they're used in these places that call themselves sanctuaries. And you have international volunteers who go there and they think by raising the cub that one day this cub's going to be returned to the wild. So they're being, they're, it's fraud, basically. It's, you know, that, that cub is then going to be used for another tourist activity, which is so-called walking with lions. Um, and when they grow too big for that, then they're put into the hunting industry or for, or for, or for breeding or whatever. And <clears throat> there's probably, there's only about two and a half thousand wild free living lions in the whole, whole of South Africa. And yet we've got between eight and 12,000 of these captive lions that are used for hunting and all the rest of it. And even in death, it's from the cradle to the, to the grave, the cycle of captive lion in South Africa, um, from the cradle to the grave. And even when they're shot, their bones are exported to the East for so-called um, um, wine, medicinal wine or whatever. So it's a whole sort of, so I exposed this back in the early nineties and it's still carrying on, it's still being exposed to this day, I and mean, we've had successes. Most international airlines will not um, export trophies of the trophy hunters, which is fantastic. I think over 40 airlines, countries like Australia, France, hopefully soon uh, United Kingdom, won't allow import, but it's been a long battle of over uh, two decades. But <clears throat> like I said, before that, I pretty much learned to let go of my anger, but I then, through exposing all these things, a lot of anger came to me from the trophy hunters and from the hunting industry. And then I was getting death threats and death threats came in all sorts of shapes and forms. Uh, threats generally, there'd be <clears throat> legal intimidation that I was gonna be sued for, for, for thousands, hundreds of thousands of, 
pounds or dollars or whatever um, <clears throat> for all sorts of reasons. But then the, the real death threats, you know, the, the messages that, that would arrive or the emails or the faxes or even more ominous when you answer your phone and you, all you can hear is someone loading a gun and firing it or dry firing it or a shot going off. <clears throat> and so much so that someone asked me to write a little bio for um, a <clears throat> promotion of, a, of this new book, Beyond the Secret Elephants, and actually put a little passage in there that during that stage, <clears throat> because I was receiving so many death threats, that I became almost a connoisseur of death threats. And, um, and it really didn't worry me at all after a while. Because at the end of the day, if someone wants to kill you, they will kill you. <laughs> They're not going to threaten to kill you. So I, I learned to let go of death threats. But that was a long time ago. The last time I had a death threat was about 20 years ago. So that's fine. <laughs> oh, thank God. So, yeah. so healing. Mm. It's your belief that it best comes from within. Could you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, we're, we're, we're getting to the stage now that I'm going to finish off talking about that final note in To Walk With Lions, aren't we? Uh, we are. Towards that. Okay, well, just before we do that, yes, very much with healing. I think it's, first of all, you, you see the most incredible healing within the animals. They have this ability to, to heal themselves. And I think through our so-called progression or whatever, or more of our distancing from our, our relationship with nature, we've actually lost a large part of our, our, our ability to self-heal. Now, we, those of us who have got companion animals or whatever, we can see, even without treatment or whatever, we can see our dog or our cat might be off color or whatever one day and we're not too sure what's going on. And then amazingly, the next day it might be fine. I had seen astonishing things in lions, like I said, with Batian. I mean, he was almost killed by these, these, these two male lions. And, and I was told by the vet, he, this lion will never ever be able to hunt for himself. Six weeks later, Batian was bringing down full grown Eland antelope, which are almost six foot of the shoulder and weigh close to a ton. That's how he managed to heal himself. He was incredible with that. But it's not reserved to Batten, it's, it's, it's lions and generally per se. Um, I remember one day talking about elephants, for example, coming across this young elephant. So it would have been about 10, 12 years old. So just about one, sort of two thirds, not even two thirds grown, one third grown. <laughs> Um, but still quite large, and it didn't have a trunk. It didn't have a trunk because it had caught the top of its trunk in a poacher's wire snare. And it had fought this, its cable wire, and it had fought this wire so much so that its entire trunk had come off. And I thought, you know, this is the most appalling situation. I mean, the most merciful thing we can do is to euthanize this elephant because it's just going to starve to death. And I left the, the herd on that day. And then I was starting to hear stories from the local people. They're saying, no, but we know this elephant and we've seen other elephants actually breaking off branches and feeding it. And I, 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 to, to a large extent, I believed it because that's how exceptional elephants are. They are truly emotional animals. I mean, they literally mourn the death of their dead one. They, they cry soul tears, but they're amazing animals. So it wasn't beyond my thoughts and possibilities that others could be feeding it until one day I was out a few weeks later and I came across this same herd of elephants and I saw this elephant, because I was thinking, how does it drink, you know, with no trunk? Because they will suck water into the trunk and then into the mouth. How does it do this without a trunk? until I saw for myself. And this was many years ago. And I, I saw this elephant then at a water hole, go down onto its knees and literally drink water like a dog. So it was just like it would have done as a little baby elephant, because baby elephants don't understand the use of, they have to learn how to use that funny thing called a trunk. 
And before they master it, they will actually drink um, from their mouth, directly from the mouth. So this like teenage elephant or early teenage elephant was resorting to adapting rather to, to that. And the wound had healed up. And, and, and I would see that elephant from time to time. And over a period of many years, I would see this elephant. And until when I finally left that area, and this elephant is, you know, years later, like five, six years later, perfectly healthy, doing really fine. I think even had a calf of its own. I mean, astonishing. So, I mean, the animals are such inspiring when it comes to healing. And we are, I, I think, first of all, we're all, we, we're all capable of enhancing the healing within ourselves, but also we also have the ability of healing other people. And the way that I do it, the way that I do it, if, um, if I know of someone who, who is not well, and it's, again, it's a very simple meditation and process. It's, it's, it's just calming oneself and just getting away from the noise and then just closing one eyes and breathing in and breathing out. And then naturally to me, and the more you do it, the easier it, it, it becomes. And then I can see literally an outline as I'm seeing you, Felice, now. I can see that with my eyes closed. And then I see a, like a veil of white going on the outline of the person. And so it totally covers the person. And that's, that's healing that's healing coming down on that person. And I've done this many times and I'm blessed that I've done it many times in the sense that I can do it, I wouldn't say without thinking, but it doesn't take, because I've done it so often, I can do it very quickly. It comes to me very quickly after my closing my eyes, I can see the person and I can see it coming down. And we can also use that same technique to heal ourselves and just to, same thing, just visualize yourself I just close my eyes now and I can see myself, believe it or not. And, and you see this, this almost like a white mist coming over yourself. And that is, that is healing. And then <clears throat> I, think, I think perhaps now I should tell that extraordinary encounter at the end of To Walk With Life or a little bit later. Yeah, um, before, you, before we end okay. that, I just want okay. you to, sh to share a little bit about what you've learned about courage that can help people navigate their way through this right now? I think really with courage, is to almost think of oneself, again, it's, it's an inspiration of the lions. I could think back again with, with Batian, you know, his enormous courage that, by all means, he should have been killed and all the rest of it. But it's that, it's that, it's that will. With courage comes willingness to, to live and to, 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 to persevere. And it's all interlinked again with the other precepts, like having, having purpose and, and seeing that through and believing that anything is absolutely possible and just digging very very deep within yourself and it's self it's self belief and that's not always easy but just having that belief and having that, that we're all capable of anything i mean look at look at me i mean i was this mixed up kid who grew up in the wilds in in africa i was thrown into boarding school in britain which i knew nothing about it in foreign surrounds my education went downhill I was, um, I had eating disorders and all the rest of it because I was, I was like a hopeless case because I was totally disconnected to my environment. I didn't, I was like living on another planet. I was used to, I was used to the African wilds. I was thrown into this alien environment, but somehow I managed to get on, on top of it. And that again goes back to, you know, having that sense of purpose. And so that is your anchor. When it comes to courage, the anchor is purpose. So if, if you if you really do believe it, what well, everyone has got a purpose, but when you firmly believe in yourself, you've got that purpose, then you you you've got the courage. Sounds cliche, but you you've got the courage to overcome absolutely anything. Mm -hmm. The sky's the limit. And you have a story to share of a young boy who was 
able to overcome a very, very serious illness uh, because of reading some of your work. Could you share that? I will. And it, it, it's, it's an extraordinary story. So I, I wrote this book, To Walk With Lions, about the seven precepts. And basically, the galley proofs had been at the publishers. I'd basically been given by my editor the pr final proofs before it goes off to the printers. And then I was asked to, and during those days, I was asked to, to travel to another town to do a fundraising event. For, for people with special needs, to raise for adults with special needs. And I was going to give a talk, and it was a fundraising, like I said, it's a fundraising evening. And just prior to, just prior to meet, um, I was still outside, this, it was like a town hall or whatever, and people were milling around. And then this lady came up with a copy of my very first book, which was called Cry for the Lions, and it was a book that I wrote as a young game ranger when I studied lions for the very first time in Botswana, and that was back in the mid-1980s, and I'd studied this population, I got to know these lions very well, Cry for the Lions, and this lady came up to me, and she said to me, and I saw her approaching the book, and I thought, oh, well, that's fantastic, you know, she probably wants me to sign her book or whatever. And she came up to me and, she, and that's what she said. She says, Gary, would you mind signing this book for me? And I said, no, not at all. And then she sort of paused and she says, this, this book has enormous significance to me as a mother. Can I tell you the story? And I said, yes, of course. And then she recounted how a, a couple of years previously, her son had a horrendous car accident, which rendered him in, in hospital, in a, in a very deep coma, in a very deep coma. And they would go there every day to talk to him, play music, try all sorts of stimulus to try and get him out of, to work him out of this coma. But if anything, he was just staying in that same state. He wasn't making any progress. And so this lady, the book had, had come out, I think a few years previously or whatever it was, quite a few years previously actually, and she started reading this book of mine, Cry for the Lions, which is, which is telling the story of, of these wild lions in Botswana and their ups and downs of lions and adventures, all that sort of thing. And they found that over the days that he became, he became, he became more sort of out, he came out of the coma increasingly more and more and more and he was showing signs and movement and all this kind of thing until it he came totally out of the coma and that was miraculous but even more extraordinary i think was the very first words that he said when he came out of the coma was he turned to his mother or turned to one side and he said what happened to the lions so it, 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 he'd been listening to the whole thing and he'd been captured by the story of these lions. And there, I mean, I would have never imagined that a book that had written on the story could have aided someone coming out of the coma state. Truly the healing okay. powers of nature. That's very beautiful, Gareth. Well, if anyone is interested in reading To Walk With Lions, which I highly recommend. It is available online uh, as an ebook called Lessons from the Lions, as well as all of Gareth's other books. So if you're so inspired, I think you'll, you'll find a lot more insight in those books. And Gareth, I thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you very much, Denise. I'm sure your words have been very inspirational to many uh, during these very difficult times. So it's been a pleasure, and we look forward to continuing reading about your amazing environmental work, and I know you're going to do more great things in the future. Thank Thanks you. very much, Denise. It's been great. Thank you.